Now, before we open up the Word of God, as it is a tradition, let us bless the Word with this ancient prayer. You can say it with me. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the Word of truth and has planted everlasting life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, who gives the Scriptures. Amen and Amen. Let us open our Bibles to Exodus chapter 15, or you can follow with the screen. So far, we can say that this book of Exodus is not for the weak-hearted atheists, for it is filled with demonstration of God's power through the many, many great miracles in there. From the burning bush, which was not consumed, to Moses' rod becoming a serpent and swallowing other serpents, to the healed leprous hand, Moses' hands, if you remember, to the ten plagues. And now here in chapter 14, 15, we see the mighty miracle of the opening of the sea, with which a definite new era has opened and where God is so active. But it is only starting. Other miracles which begin right at the end of our chapter today are tailored for the need of the believers, not only the Israelites, but for us too. The first miracle took care of Israel's need for water, but with a powerful message of redemption. There they encountered the bitter waters of Mara, and there the Lord told them to take a tree or a piece of, of a tree and throw it into the bitter waters, and lo and behold, the waters were pure and good to drink. How could a tree make the water drinkable? And why a tree? What does it represent? And then, as the community of Israel was hungry, suddenly God sends them food from heaven, that is the manna. The manna and this gift, or bread from God, continued throughout the next 40 years, day after day. And then, when the community asked for a varied menu, for they did, God sent them quails, thousands of them, so they all ate and were satisfied. And throughout their journey, the Lord never failed to, to, to always be present with them. The pillar of cloud, remember, which is a symbol of the Shekinah glory, that is the presence of God, guided them day in and day out. Wherever they went, he was there. The pillar of fire also, which was also to give light at night and no doubt was a visible comfort to the nation going through the wilderness. But all these miracles were the outcome of a testing and trials that God sent to Israel. The whole journey was really in preparation and training for Israel who was to receive the word of God and present the author to the nations of the world. And so in many ways, our journey here on earth is so similar to that of Israel. We both are saved by the sacrifice of the Lamb, and we both are still journeying through the wilderness and to the, the promised land, our eternal abode, as far as we are concerned. And so it is my prayer that we'll all be blessed by what we're going to read today in Exodus, especially in the Song of Moses. Let us resume this study of the Song of Moses, and then we will look at the miracle of the healing tree. And so after the opening of the sea and Israel's salvation from the enemy, the people were so overwhelmed, and Moses as well, that he composed this song where the Lord is so magnified using the highest and greatest words in the Hebrew vocabulary. This is a song of thanksgiving, but also one that is prophetic and also timeless, like the Ne'er Tamid, if you remember, that the eternal flame that was lit in the menorah, the temple, it's still burning always through the word of God. Let us begin to see how it begins. Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord and said, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. The song begins, I want to tell you, in a very unusual way. The first words, then Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song, is in the future tense. While they were singing it right there and then. This attracted the attention of many rabbinical commentators. 
But this is surely to stamp it with a prophetic aspect in mind. For as we have seen, this song will be sung in the, at the end of the tribulation by Israel, along with the believers from all the nations of the world just before the Lord establishes his kingdom. But the grammatical tense goes even further, for it is not only future, but it is in the singular. It is Moses and the sons of Israel who are singing, and yet the verb is singular. Literally, we can read it as, then Moses and the sons of Israel, he will sing this song to the Lord. The singular is like an invitation. For everyone opening this chapter to sing along and thank God and magnify his name for all that he has done and all that he's doing for us. The song itself brings us back to the event of the miracle of the sea, but using such powerful poetic message. It is the same thing as we read before, but very magnified. Of God. We have already seen that his name is mentioned at least 30 times in different forms in just within 18 verses. But along with these names, he is so highly magnified through different qualifications. The, the song says that he is what? Verse 1, highly exalted, majestic in power, verse 6. He is addressed in verse 7 as the greatness of your excellence. He is in verse 11, majestic in holiness. And awesome in praises. This poem is filled with gratitude to God. As for the action he takes, one has noticed that we have here a, a true lexicon of military victory. Not only did he close the sea over the Egyptian, but we read that he hurled it into the sea. The Hebrew for hurled, Rama, means to throw upward in the air just like a child playing with his toys. Verse 4, he did not only engulf Pharaoh's chariots and his army in the sea, he cast them in the sea. The Hebrew word cast, laro, means to throw downward with great force. The Targum translated as to shoot as one shoots an arrow. In verse 6, we read that he shatters the enemy. This is like taking a brittle object and breaking it into pieces. And along these descriptions, words are used that bring us to considered eternity and even hell. Verse 5, we read of the deep covers them and they went down into the depth like a stone. The deep, tehom, we have seen it before, speaks of deep darkness, like the darkness that covered the earth at the beginning in the Genesis account. And then the word depth, mezola, from Zula, which is used to describe the abyss itself. And the power with which he executed all these things could be seen in the word used in verse 8 when he divided the sea. We read that the water stood up like a heap. The word heap, ned, in Hebrew, from the root nadab, means to flee, or when one is banished, or when one is excommunicated. Everything was done with such force. You know, we get the idea of the great superiority of God and how much we need to read these things today as we see so much evil around us. So much evil which seems to be left unattended without justice or, re or retribution. The scriptures assures us that it is only temporary. God in all his might is coming back to make all things right. This is what happens when you read the scriptures and especially this poem. There's also some irony in the descriptions. You know, there's a word, the word congealed, which is used in verse 8. The deep were congealed in the heart of the sea. You know, this was to describe how the floor, the sea floor, became solid so the people could walk. You know, this word in Hebrew, congealed, kapha, described in Job as the process of milk becoming cheese as if they were walking on cheese. Must have been very comfortable, by the way. Another word is found in verse 7. He overthrows those who rise up against them. Now, this is a little overstretched, but I want to share it with you. Anyone knowing a little bit of Arabic and reading the Hebrew word will surely smile. The word overthrow is the Hebrew aras, meaning to crush, to break into pieces, from where we get the word harissa. 
right? Harissa, for many of you Middle Eastern cuisine enthusiasts, be, you know, became in an Arabic, an Arabic word, actually, which described a hot sauce, well known in North Africa from Libya to Morocco. So reading this, it's like that he made Harissa out of the enemy of Israel. It's funny. <laughs> and this poem brings out the identity of God for us. Now, who is our God? We, we are told in verse 2 that he is my strength. He is my song. He is my salvation. My God, my Father's God. You know, each of these five attributes has a story to tell us about our Creator. And the result is, at the end of the verse, and I will praise and extol Him. Let's look at these attributes. He is my strength. This word is used in the sense of God being my refuge, my protection. This is what the word conveys. It is a strength that we have in Him. As Paul says when he says, but I am weak. When I am weak, then I am strong in, of course, the Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. This word, strength, in Hebrew, raz, is used many times in the Psalms, where David speaks of his strength in the Lord, not in his army, in the Lord. He says in Psalm 21, 1, he says, O Lord, in your strength, the king shall be glad. Not in the strength of his army. And he had a big army. And the song really brings out God as a shepherd to those who follow him. You know, in another verse, I don't want to bring you there. It's actually Exodus 15, 13. Look what it says. Same song. In your loving kindness, you have led the people whom you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. See the process? He leads, he redeems, and he guides. This is what happened to Israel. He led them to Egypt. There he redeemed them through the blood of the Lamb at Passover. And then, see the last word, he guided them. This word guide is one that a shepherd does. It means to pasture, to lead with care. And he does this, it says, in loving kindness. The word at the beginning of the verse. The Hebrew word Many are familiar with it is chesed. You remember chesed? The word chesed is powerful. It is from this word where we get the word chasid, who come, comes from, that is, uh, which means holy one, godly one. For this type of kindness is from God and sanctifies the person and those around, of course. And see the last word. See where he leads us all to his holy habitation. This is a promise of heaven. The shepherd leads his flock home. This is what God is doing with us. So the believer has been led, redeemed. He or she is being shepherded into heaven, which is his habitation. And this promise of heaven is reaffirmed in this same song, in verse 17. See what it says. You will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The mountains of his inheritance could be Jerusalem here on earth or the new Jerusalem for us in heaven. This is how heaven is called. Notice what it says at the end. With his own hands, he made this. The, the very same thing we read in Hebrews chapter 11.10, where we learn that heaven is a city whose architect and builder is God. And Jesus is working on it right now. Right? Remember in John 14, he says, I go and prepare a place for you. He's still our carpenter, right? Putting these two verses together, we have here for the believer today an eternal about heaven. It, which is his habitation, the mountain of his inheritance, the place he has made for his dwellings, the sanctuary he has made. I want to tell you, anyone who doubts his or her salvation should realize that all of these things begin with the words, you will bring them and plant them. We're in heaven. This is God's promise. These are, again, very precious words of encouragement for us. By the word of God, heaven is our destiny. Have you thought about it, by the way? This is great. You know, we see what's happening in the world, really bad, but it means that it's coming very soon. 
And because it is such a blessed thing to know and meditate on, the second word in verse 2 is the word song. He became, he becomes my song. He is my strength and my song. The Lord is my strength and song. He is my protection and joy. The joy of his presence and of the knowledge of this great city that is ours touches even our worship. Our, our singing. We sing to worship and to thank the Lord for what he has done for us. In Ephesians chapter 5, 19, by the way. After that, Paul tells us to be filled with the Spirit of God. He tells us to sing and make melody in your hearts and to the Lord. Singing is an expression of gratitude. This is why worship is so important. And then we read how all this became possible. Because he has become our Yeshua. He has become our salvation. He has come down to become a savior. This is the great story and simple story of the Bible. But there's something noticeable in chapter 15, by the way. You know, before this, the term used throughout Exodus for the presence of God is the angel of Jehovah. Do you remember that? He is the one who was in the burning bush. He is the one leading the Israelites. But here in this song, the angel of God is not mentioned by name at all. Yet, the angel of the Lord we have seen is the physical manifestation of God. It has nothing to do with angels that we know or their nature, but the term describes a theophany, the appearance again of God on earth, for he, the angel is worshipped, so he must be God. And so rabbis agree that the salvation at the sea was all through the angel of, the Je of Jehovah, to quote Nachmanides. And the reason why the angel of the Lord is not mentioned by name at all it is because he is one and the same with Jehovah, with God himself. Ancient rabbis, those who were living before Jesus came to earth, have understood, have understood something about his presence and see how they call him, by the way. In the Targum of Neophyte, they speak of him as the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord led on before them during the, the daytime in a pillar of cloud and so on, quoting Exodus 13.21. The other Targum, Targum of Jonathan, speaks of him as the Memra. Memra, he takes revenge on anyone who exalts himself, they say. And the word Memra is the Aramaic translation of the word, or the word of God. This is then how they call God's manifestation on earth. And it was at this time, the time when Jewish people were reading these Targums, actually in their Bibles, in the synagogues, that John the Apostle came and said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, explaining that there was God in a body who came to save us. Thus clarifying that the name of God who came down to save Israel from slavery came again as Yeshua to save them from the nations and from the evil one. And the last two words. In verse 2. My God, my father's God. This is who our God is. This is when the Lord answered Moses' question when he asked him, What is your name? Remember in Exodus 3.13. There the Lord answered, I am. But soon after he demonstrated his might through the ten plagues. And here through the opening of the sea. And so Israel recognized their father's God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Those who come to know God through Yeshua will recognize one more time their fathers. Their father, God, that is. He himself is also their father, their true father. They were seeking all their life, their true shepherd. You don't have to be Jewish to know God, of course. He is your father in a sense that he's your creator. He is the one you were seeking all the time. This is then who our God is is. There is one other attribute of God that is given to us in this song, one which we usually forget. See Exodus 15.3. The Lord is an individual of war. The Lord is his name. You know, some translation have the Lord is a man of war, but since in the Hebrew God is not an Adam, he's not a man, uh, but an individual, the Hebrew actually here is Ish. That is a being, an individual. Yet the Lord is a warrior. But how 
do you figure out this truth with the fact that we're told that God is love? How do you put the two together? I want to tell you that both are true. Both cannot stand without the others. The problem is that we push and promote the side of love, but we forget the other. Have you thought of Jesus as a warrior? He is, and he is a fierce one. Did you know that he killed 185,000 Assyrians because they were, they were coming to invade Jerusalem? This is in 2 King 19.35. Have you noticed his own words in Matthew 23 about the eight woes and how he speaks to those who deprive men from his word? He speaks to them as fools and as blind men. And he compares, it to, compares them to tombs. He calls them murderers, serpents, vipers. And says that they all are heading straight to hell. Justice and judgment are part of love. Without them, love becomes fake, artificial, which only can last a moment. Isn't it the Lord called by Moses and in the book of Hebrews... A consuming fire, Hebrews 12, 29. We learn from the prophets like Daniel, Ezekiel, and John when they were brought up to heaven. You know, they might have been brought actually at the same time. That his throne was fiery flame, its wheels burning fire. For holiness cannot tolerate sin. But because he is also love and knows how fierce the judgment of hell is, he came down in the form of a man to die for us so that we may have salvation. Again, this is the story of the scriptures. This is love. However, the final victory will be his. And this is when this song of Moses, which depicts him as a warrior and loving shepherd, will be sang. Let us read the account of Revelation 15, verses 2 and 3 where we see, actually, the people who came out of the tribulation, right, sing this very song. It says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bond servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. This is how far, by the way, this song brings us. Here we have those again who have been victorious over the beast, being so highly rewarded by standing in front of God on a sea of glass. From one sea to the others, that is, from one victory to another. The Lord miraculously opened the sea for the Israelites to walk on dry land. And here Israel and the believers of all nations stand, are standing on another type of sea. And the final de destination, that is the sea of glass. In the first sea, we witness the birth of the nation of Israel. With the second sea, Israel will finally be entering the land in peace with Yeshua. It took a long time, but I want to tell you, no moment was lost. Nothing is lost with God. And what is this sea of glass in heaven? What does it represent? Both Ezekiel and Revelation tell us that it is crystal. The ancient rabbis in the Targum on Ezekiel translated, the, translate this scene as a mighty ice field. This is what they saw. And climbed towards their heads from above. They saw it as white as ice. Kera. For crystal is white, of course. So the sea of glass being white... Pure white represents the holiness of God. As for its location, it is important. In Revelation, we are told that it is before the throne. Ezekiel tells us that it is above the angels. And this is just like it was in the Holy of Holies, where the two cherubims were bowing down toward the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's footrest. At the temple, it represents the laver or the, uh, the sea. Hold on. Just lost my notes, but that's fine. It's coming back. Now, what is the laver? What does it represent? The laver represents 
the water where the priests would wash themselves before they will enter the presence of God, which you have in the Holy of Holies, right? It is called Chaim or Chaim Mozak, Sea of Copper, relating to the Sea of Glass in the original plan given actually to Moses and also to David. When the Lord gave the plan of heaven to David, and David gave it to Solomon to build the temple, he built it according to the temple in heaven where we're going very soon. And the laver at the temple stood just before, again, the holy of holy, right, where God is in order to wash ourselves. This is a part of our sanctification. Before we come to God, it requires always cleansing itself. Furthermore, see that in Revelation 15, here the sea of glass is mis mixed with fire. This fire, as the water of the laver, speaks of the purity and holiness of God. As they will sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, here the Bible makes a correlation between the Passover and the death of the Messiah and between Israel's deliverance and our redemption. If you are looking for a part of the scriptures to memorize, this song will greatly bless you. Right? I want to tell you this. It was the El Moody who used to say, Sin will keep you from this book, or the book will keep you from sin, right? This is how strong the song is. Let's, let's read verses 3 to 4. This is the song. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty, righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all the nation will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. Great and wonderful, great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just these words could be the subject of long prayers and of thanksgiving, as it brings us to consider the full revelation of our Creator, who is Lord God Almighty. Here are the three parts of the immense and comprehensible nature of our God. He is righteous, true, and see that He is the King of the nations. Not the Antichrist. He's not. He will not be. Not the dragon. Not Pharaoh. But God, the Lord, the Almighty is and will be over all the nation. And it adds to it by quoting the last chapter of the book of Isaiah. All, says the nation, all mankind will come and worship before you. And this will happen when his righteous acts will be revealed. That is, when he will come at the second coming, and they will recognize the one they have pierced. Amen? Amen? This is how, again, how far the book of Exodus brings us. Now we'll go down right to the end of the chapter and conclude with the, the wonderful type of the work of the Messiah. We'll cover the other parts another time. Let us read what is actually a surprising account. The Torah has this great way to prepare the reader always to meet the Messiah. It's all over the Torah. For us, the following account is not that astonishing, but it should be to any Jew or anyone who does not know who Jesus is. Look at verse 22, 24 to 24. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Mara, they could not drink the waters of Mara, for the waters were bitter. Therefore, it was named Mara. So the people grumbled at Moses, saying, What shall we drink? First, how I wish that the Bible stopped in verse 21. And then we'll jump right away to Exodus, or that is Revelation 15. Everything will be fine, but it didn't happen this way, right? We need actually to learn more than that, right? And so as the Israelites entered for the first time the wilderness, they were tested. After three days' walk in the hot desert, they began to lack some water, and so they somehow forget, they forgot to look up to God's presence, to the cloud and pillars. They, they, they were still there, right? So they forgot and they grumbled. That's human nature, isn't it? And so they ask, what shall we drink? This is a question God seemed to have been waiting for 
them to ask for what happened next is extraordinary and exceptional, but the message is simple, and the rabbis, I think, understood it. See verse 25. Then he, Moses, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and he threw it into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Now, what is this? How could a tree make the waters sweet? And to add to it, to it, the word for showed is not to indicate where the tree was. The word really means to instruct. It means to teach. As when Moses will use the same word to explain the Torah in chapter 24. Or when Moses, or David, that is, says in Psalm 119, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your status. Modern rabbinic commentators do not make much about this passage, but the use of the word in this miracle brought many ancient rabbis to conclude that God was actually speaking about the Torah. The tree, they say, must be the Torah, for it heals and makes things sweet. Isn't that beautiful? And so for them, the tree was the word of God. So we'll start with our interpretation, by the way. Because it's going to lead us right to the Messiah. One commentary, the Mikilta of Rabbi Ishmael, a book whose ideas are dated from the first century, says that the living life sustaining water symbolizes the Torah. And the words of this rabbi added something that influenced actually the history of Israel. He added that to be deprived of its spiritual sustenance for three days is life threatening. And this gave rise to a tradition in today's synagogues. Today in the synagogues, the Torah is taken out of the Torah Ark, which is in the back, as you have it in the picture, or the Aron HaKodesh, and, and, and is actually taken out three times a week, every three days somehow, on Saturday or Monday and Thursday. And so this is inspired from this passage and what this rabbi said, so that the Torah will always be there more than three days, it's a danger, they say. So three times a day, a week that is, so that Israel will not grumble and fall into sin. But what does the tree again represent? Let us begin again with the rabbinical interpretation. There's something else that these ancient commentators noticed. They ask, how come something bitter will make another bitter things think sweet? The tree for them and the waters were bitter, and so how does something Good come out of two bitter things. Later, when medieval rabbi Ibn Ezra wrote this in, in his commentary, he says, human beings use the sweet to cure what is bitter, but God cures the bitter with the bitter. That's almost a prophecy that he's saying here. You know why? But the use of the tree, I want to tell you, is a prophecy itself. When he came to give his life, Yeshua came to give his life, we're told that like this tree, he became bitter for us to save us. The Spirit gives us the answer in 2 Corinthians 5.21 when he inspired these words. For he, God, made him Yeshua, who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the tree, the word of God, which makes our life sweet and forever. And there might be the reason why Peter and Paul actually use the word tree instead of cross sometimes. Speaking of Yeshua, he says in 1 Peter 2.24, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, he says, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed Quoting Isaiah 53. Peter was in Jerusalem speaking to Messianic Jews who were going through much persecution. And so by using the word tree, he was bringing them back to the Torah and made this association and to see that Yeshua is the Torah himself. He is the fulfillment of the Torah. He is the tree who saves us. One more thing. I'll conclude with this. It, I want to tell you, it did require faith for Moses to actually pick up a tree and throw it in the water. He did not say, Lord, I can't do that. They're going to think I'm crazy. And I already have so much trouble with them, right? But he did it, right? He believed God, and he must have been so happy that he believed God and that he did it. 
We'll resume this study next time. Let us bow our head in prayer. Now to us from him who is and who was and who is to come from Yeshua Mashiach, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Heavenly Father, teach us. Teach us to be like him. Teach us to be like you. Mold us into your image. Teach us to love. You are the God who sanctifies. So we ask that you work in us what is pleasing to you just like you worked in Moses and the children of Israel. And encourage our hearts in your ability to bring us to maturity both as individual and as a congregation. Because today again, Lord, we wish to be lost in your Torah, in your word, in you. Teach us, Lord. Teach and every, everyone here to come closer to you. Revive us, sanctify us, allow us to let your spirit to saturate every faculty, subdue every passion, and use every power of our nature for obedience to you. In Yeshua's name and to the congregation, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord makes lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, may the Lord bless you all with the words we have seen. Amen. Amen.